Hello, everyone, and welcome to our January episode of Golden Zoomies. For those of you who don't know me, I am Dr. Kelly Deal. I am the Senior Director of Science Communications here at Morris Animal Foundation, and I've got a great group of speakers today. But before we go to our begin our presentations, I'm going to invite the lovely Amy Torres and Emily Evans to join me and go over, introduce themselves and go over a few ground rules. Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm the veterinary research manager for the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Um, I do a lot of communication with our participants. So there's a chance if you're a participant that we have chatted. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Torres. I'm the executive assistant for scientific programs. So I just, assist the team on the back end with scheduling and other stuff. It's nice to see everyone today. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for introducing yourselves. I'm going to go over very quickly our speaker roster in the order that you're going to see these folks. First up will be the lovely and talented Brenna Swafford who is our Golden Retriever Lifetime Study Data Manager, and she's going to present on the state of the study paper, which many of you may be familiar with. That was published last year. Then we're going to have the dynamic duo of Mary Kokorin and Liana Moss of the University of Denver's Institute for Human-Animal Connection, and they're going to present on demographics and the human-animal bond, and sorry, Mary, I think I butchered your name. And last, but certainly not least, um, Dr. Julia Labadee, um, senior scientist at Kinship and former Golden Retriever Lifetime Study epidemiologist. I think a bunch of you know her as well. And she's going to talk about another paper that was published last year on toxicity and geolocation and cancer, which I know is another topic that you guys are really, really interested in. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Brenna take over. Just so you guys know who are listening, I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A a bit. If there's something that I feel we need to interrupt the group that's speaking, I will go ahead and do that. If not, we're going to have a little time for questions at the end of each presentation and then again at the end of the webinar. So take it away, Brenna. All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you, Kelly, for the introduction. Um, so yes, like Kelly said, I'm the data manager here at Morris Animal Foundation. So I just specialize in everything data and sample related when it comes to the study. Um, I'm here to, today to discuss the cohort profile, which was published in June 2022, using data from the study up to May 2021. It was created to provide a description of the current state of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, including its population, method of data collection, publications to date, and to outline the available data and samples to be used by the scientific community. So the first part of this presentation is going to be a bit of an overview for those actually involved in the study, but will be new for those joining in for the first time. The first question to ask is why did we choose to study Golden Retrievers? Goldens are continually ranked in the top five most popular breeds by the American Kennel Club, which allowed for the cohort to be established across a more geographically diverse environment. It is also widely known that they are happy, trainable dogs, making them perfect candidates for the complex annual exa exams that they have to endure. They are also highly prone to cancer. During a survey of 1400, 1,400 golden retrievers conducted by the Golden Retriever Club of America in 1998, it was found that cancer was the leading cause of death for 61% of the 420 dogs that died, with the most common cancers being hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, high-grade mast cell tumors, and osteosarcoma. Also, having one specific dog breed helps to limit genetic variability and improves the ability to find breed-relevant wellness strategies. In a breed with such a high occurrence of cancer, this is crucial. So what is the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study? The aim of the study is to evaluate nutritional, environmental, lifestyle, reproductive, and genetic factors that for cancer and other common disorders found in Golden Retrievers. 3,044 Golden Retrievers were enrolled between 2012 and 2015, and we will continue to follow them throughout the duration of their lives. Based on studies such as the previously mentioned one performed by the Golden Retriever Club of America, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, high-grade mast cell tumors, and osteosarcoma are the primary outcomes of interest in this study, as they are frequently found in Golden Retrievers. But we are also interested in studying other common conditions such as hypothyroidism, hip dysplasia, and heart failure. 
there are three big categories of study components. These, uh, there's some that are collected annually, there's some that are collected when a malignancy is suspected, and the final after a dog dies. Annual compliance is contingent upon completion of two questionnaires and sample submission. The annual owner question questionnaire collects information regarding the dog's lifestyle, physical activity, diet, at-home grooming, and a CBARC, which is a previously validated behavior questionnaire, and much more. The annual veterinary visit is then completed and whole blood, serum, feces, urine, hair clippings, and toenail samples are collected. Half of these annual samples are shipped priority overnight to be frozen and stored at our biobank, while the other half are submitted for clinical pathology, including a complete blood count, serum biochemistry profile, fecal evaluation for ova and parasites, urinalysis, heart room antigen test, and a thyroid hormone level. Results are both shared with the veterinarian and stored in our database for future use. Finally, the annual veterinary questionnaire is completed where information from the past 12 months is compiled, including medical history, physical exam findings, vaccination history, and prescriptions. The second study component is when a malignancy is suspected. Biopsy kits are supplied for sample submission to our diagnostic lab laboratory for histology. We also request a five millimeter sample to be submitted to our biorepository and RNA later. If a malignancy is confirmed, we ask that the, veterinary complete, the veterinarian complete an annual additional questionnaire to obtain details surrounding diagnostics performed and actions taken. The final study components are collected after a dog dies. Necropsies are encouraged but not required within our cohort. We have a guide for abbreviated necropsies, which, which includes samples of collecting samples of healthy and diseased samples from core tissues and along with any other suspected malignancy. A comprehensive knee necropsy guide is also available for those equipped to obtain more tissues, so this is usually in the university setting. All tissues are collected in formalin for histopathology and an RNA later for biobanking. A death and necropsy questionnaire is requested from the registered study veterinarian, the veterinarian who last saw the dog, and the veterinarian completing the necropsy to obtain information about the cause and manner of death, as well as collect gross necropsy findings when applicable. Finally, we collect the dog's complete medical records from both primary and specialty clinics the dog was seen at, and we use these records to both uh, to adjudicate both malignancies and cause of death within our cohort one last time. All biopsy and necropsy samples undergo an adjudication process involving two to three pathologists to confirm diagnosis. The first sample is read by the initial diagnostic laboratory that received the samples. The samples are then transferred to a team at Colorado State University's Clinical Immun Immunology Laboratory, where a CSU pathologist performs a read blinded from any previous diagnoses. If the first and second read agree, the case is considered adjudicated. If they disagree, a third pathologist completes another blind read of the specimens. And if all three pathologists disagree, then they all convene to come to a consensus on diagnosis. Paraffin wax blocks and slides from adjudications are inventoried and stored at Morris Animal Foundation. Our cancer diagnoses are further, di further broken down into three different categories regarding diagnosis method. Tier one includes definitive diagnoses that have been microscopically confirmed via histology or cytology and read by a board certified pathologist. So this would include all of our biopsy and necropsy samples. Tier two includes presumptive diagnoses made via visualization or imaging without microscopic confirmation. In-house cytology is also confirmed, considered a tier two diagnosis. An example of this is if a dog has pericardial effusion and a heart mass visualized on an ultrasound, this would be considered a tier two hemangiosarcoma diagnosis. And our final tier includes presumptive diagnoses made based on clinical suspicion only. So any sort of cancer suspicion that no diagnostics were performed would fall under this tier. We have had excellent participation and retention throughout this study as seen in the chart on the left. As of May 31st, 2021, when this manuscript was prepared, overall retention was 86%, with 2,251 dogs still enrolled and alive, 352 dogs enrolled deceased. Only 441 dogs had been lost to follow-up, most of which were lost early in the study. Reasons for withdrawal were collected from 96 of the 441 dogs. The most common reasons noted were owner hardship, which 29% of the owners reported, 21% listed rehoming of the dog, and 15% listed the cause of withdrawal as dog anxiety at the vet. The table on the right displays annual participation for baseline through year six of the study, along with how many dogs remain enrolled, died, or withdrew per study year. 
Percentages for compliance are based upon the number of compliant dogs compared to the total population alive to complete annual study components for that study year. Only study years one through five were used for analysis as at the time of publication, those were the only complete study years. As you can see for study year six, we had 14 dogs that were still able to commit annual, submit annual study components and that just increased the further on in study years you went. Annual participation, which equates completion of all three of those annual components previously mentioned, ranges from 74 to 87% for study years one through five. Since annual veterinary questionnaire completion is contingent upon the completion of the annual owner questionnaire, we see a slightly lower vet participation when analyzing compliance. Annual owner participation, annual, annual owner compliance ranges from 80 to 93%, and veterinary compliance ranges from 75 to 89%. If we only consider dogs that had an annual owner questionnaire compliant, annual questionnaire component completed, and therefore this limits the veterinary popula population to only those that actually complete a veterinary questionnaire, then the annual veterinary compliance would instead be 92 to 96%. We'll be going in a bit of a zigzag across the side to look at various figures, starting on the top left. Each of these numbers is based on the dog's last questionnaire submission for the cohort still enrolled at the time of manuscript preparation. Dogs still alive in the cohort were on average 8.3 years old, with the youngest being 6.7 years and the oldest 11.3 years old. Moving to the graph on the top right, while most of our population is fixed, we, do still, we did still have 19% intact. The first table on the left shows a breakdown of the age at which spay and neuter occurred, as you can see, there's a relatively even distribution of age. Geographic distribution remains consistent with baseline with an approximately even split across the regions. And the final table on the bottom left displays the major that the majority of study dogs had a healthy purina body condition score of five to six, but there were, was 37% that were overweight or obese, which just means they had a BCS between six and nine. As of May 2021, we had nearly 19,000 of each sample at our biobank, all of which are available for the scientific community. At baseline, DNA was extracted and stored from the whole blood samples for future analysis. In the past few years, we have used this DNA to genotype all of the dogs, all the study dogs, and use, it is be, going to be used in genome-wide association studies. As of May 2021, we had obtained 223 of our goal of 500 primary endpoints, which was 45%. Hemangiosa chroma was our most common primary endpoint with 120 cases, 89 of which were tier one cases. And as a reminder, tier one just means that they were microscopically confirmed by a board certified pathologist. The second most common endpoint was lymphoma and leukemia with 85 cases, 77 of which were tier one cases. We've had fewer high-grade mast cell tumor and osteosarcoma cases than expected. We've only had 10 high-grade mast cell tumor cases, nine of which were tier one, and eight osteosarcoma cases, six of which were tier one. 68 of our lymphoma and leukemia dogs had been subtyped. 30 of these were found to be B-cell subtypes and 32 of those T-cell subtypes. This graph shows the cumulative incidence or how high of a risk there is for a dog of, to develop any of the primary endpoint cancers at each age throughout the study based on diagnoses made within our cohort. So the higher the cumulative incidence, the higher the risk there is for the dog to develop that cancer. Lymphoma and leukemia was the most common cancer in dogs less than six years old with this study incidence in the years that followed as indicated by the dark blue line and its relatively gradual slope. In comparison, mandrosarcoma incidence, as indicated by the red line, started low but steeply grew after age six, becoming the most common cancer at age eight. Incidence of high-grade mast cell tumor and osteosarcoma continue to remain relatively low, as previously mentioned. And then I just have a final overview of some manuscripts that have been published at the same time, around the same time or before this paper was published. The first looked at changes in annual lab work intervals in a population of healthy study participants and validated results in an independent sample of additional healthy participants. This study helped to identify vari the variability in testing and the importance of baseline laboratory data to assess individual variation. The second study explored factors associated with noncompliance after baseline. This study found that noncompliant owners were more likely to have unvaccinated dogs and dogs who slept in the garage versus the bedroom. This study may be useful for predicting compliance in future study cohort, future cohort studies. 
and future analysis will evaluate whether these factors are consistent with predictors for compliance at later times in the study or if this just applied to baseline study. The third study found that spaying or neutering at six months of age or younger was associated with an increased risk of orthopedic injury. In addition, spaying or neutering at any age has the increased risk of being overweight or obese. This study, along with other publications, have identified a need for breed-specific recommendations on the optimal age to spay or neuter. The fourth study found a significant negative correlation between genomic measurements of inbreeding and potential to reproduce in, five, in 100 female intact dogs. This study indicated that golden retrievers would benefit from limiting inbreeding and would be useful in future studies to explore other affected traits. And the two additional publications provided overviews of the study, including goals and study design prior to enrollment, along with baseline population characteristics. You will hear about more recent publications and the presenters after me, but if you're interested in more details regarding any of these publications here or any future publications, all are tracked on the Golden Retriever Lifetime Studies homepage on morrisanimalfoundations.org for you to look at. And that is all I have. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Brenna. That was really interesting. And I've been getting a couple of questions about where to find some of this information. And just to reiterate what Brenna said, the all of these publications are available on our website and have links to the publications so you can check on them yourselves. I would like to invite Mary and Liana now to go ahead and give their presentation. We're really excited about this one. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for having us. I'm gonna share my screen. Hey, hello everyone. Um, very happy to be a part of Golden Zoomies today. Um, my name is Mary Corcoran. I'm here with Liana Moss. Uh, we are both from the Institute for Human Animal Connection. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about a study that we conducted with contributions from the wonderful Emily Evans from the Morris Animal Foundation. Um, and we were uh, interested in exploring the influence of participant characteristics on compliance, retention, and dog health outcomes. So the Institute for Human-Animal Connection is often uh, lovingly referred to as IHAC. Um, it was established in 2005. It's a research center situated within the School of Social Work at the University of Denver, uh, where our main mission is to elevate the relationships between people, other animals, and the environment to improve uh, health and welfare. Two main areas of focus are both education and research. Our overarching research question is how do human animal environment interactions affect individual and community health? Um, so looking more into the study that we're gonna be talking about today, we had two main interests. Uh, one, how social determinants of health, human animal bond and other environmental factors might have a relationship with compliance and retention. Compliance being how well participants adhere to study protocols. Retention being how many participants remain in the study compared to those who drop out or become inactive. Uh, the second goal of ours was to look at how these factors might have a relationship with the health outcomes of uh, the owner's pet, pet dogs. Um, in our methods, we did statistical analysis using existing data transferred from Morris Animal Foundation and a IHAC developed supplemental survey uh, that we will go into more detail uh, later on. Here's a look at some of the demographic data that we were able to collect. Um, first being a, a wonderfully high sample size of 743 participants, um, which gave us a lot of data to work with. Um, we participants in this study uh, were primary a high percentage of white women who rent their own space, own their own personal vehicle, um, and a highly educated group with 43.3% having a college degree, 40% earning a post-college degree. Um, and 52.4% identifying as retired. Uh, in this graphic here, we are showing uh, the average annual income of those who identified that they were not retired. Um, and the main takeaway here is, excuse me, it's skewed towards a high income relative to the average income of the state of Colorado. We have a fun graphic for you here where we asked um, how often do you use 
the 3000 Strong Community Girls Heroes and Supporters Facebook group uh, with nearly 150 participants uh, responding that they use this group every day. And then we also asked why you choose to use the Girls Facebook group uh, with the highest represented answer being to give and receive support. Um, as you see, a lot of these answers are represented pretty well, um, but we thought that was fun that this Facebook group has kind of become a, its own micro community of support. Um, so here we're taking a further look at what the participation data looked like. Um, this participation, otherwise known as compliance, shows how well the, uh, these participants were able to adhere to study protocols in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Um, so the annual uh, owner questionnaire uh, about the owner's dog and their environment, there was an average completion rate of 95.6% um, and a 91.8% average percentage of completion in the annual veterinary questionnaire uh, where the veterinarians are answering questions about the dog's health, um, and this is important to point out because these numbers are astronomically large compared to human clinical trials, uh, which reflects why this uh, Golden Retriever Lifetime Study uh, is so special. Um, so here we're going further into uh, that supplemental survey that I was speaking to earlier. Um, the first instrument being the human animal bond score which was taken, two subscales were taken from the pet attachment lifetime scale. And this instrument is measuring um, the strength of the owner's bond with their dog. As you see here, there is um, a high score of 4.6 out of five, which indicates a high bond with your dog. So the higher the score, the higher the bond with your dog. And here the average participant um, scored wonderfully high. Um, the second instrument, which is the social determinants of health score. Um, and social determinants of health can be conceptualized as the conditions in the environment where you live, work, and play that can impact quality of life outcomes for both yourself and your pet. Uh, there are five dimensions to uh, social determinants of health, that being healthcare access and quality, education, access, and quality, social and community support, economic stability, and neighborhood and built environment. Um, so this, this score that you see, 4.3 out of 5, um, another high score, which indicate this high score indicates fewer challenges in each of these dimensions. Um, and similarly, uh, our, our girls' participation score um, is asking questions about um, access to participation in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, barriers to that participation. Um, so the higher the score here, the fewer barriers you have to participating in the girls' study. Um, and some uh, incidences that might produce a lower score of this girls' participation instrument would be difficulty accessing a veterinarian, difficulty getting appointments, uh, difficulty in having transportation to these appointments, uh, things of that nature. Um, and here we had uh, a nice high score of 4.6 out of five um, for the average participant um, score in the girls participation instrument. So jumping into our findings regarding compliance, otherwise known as participation, um, we found through our data analysis that participants with a higher annual veterinary uh, questionnaire response rate were actually more likely to have dogs that were diagnosed with otitis externa, which is also known as ear infections. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the dog health diagnoses we evaluated in the next few slides. Um, but this was the only correlation we found between the annual veterinary questionnaire or the annual owner questionnaire, um, which we considered the factors of compliance, um, and dog health conditions or the scores that Mary just outlined before with human animal bond, um, social determinants of health and girls participation. Um, we may see this higher likelihood of getting this ear infection diagnosis 
um, because folks who attend a veterinarian more often or have access to a veterinarian and go more often um, are more likely probably to get a very common diagnosis for their dog of ear infections. Um, we know already that Goldens are predisposed to developing ear infections um, due to the shape of their ears and, and other factors. Um, unfortunately, we could not assess the relationship between the demographics we just described to you, uh, the scales or scores and retention because we did not obtain enough responses from inactive participants um, in our sample. So we only received about eight responses. So we were unable to um, compare those with um, enough validity. Here you will see um, of our 743 respondents, um, the frequency of canine diagnoses. We obtained this data from Morris Animal Foundation and you'll see that they're grouped into really three sections, cancer um, or primary endpoints that Morris Animal Foundation is looking into, um, skin and allergy conditions, and then infectious disease and parasites. So you'll see um, otitis externa or ear infections has an extremely high rate of diagnosis, which again goes towards the this concept that ear infections are just really common in dogs and in golden retrievers in general. So our findings, these are at the top, you'll see um, SDH or social determinants of health, um, and you'll see girls participation scores. These are the, the scores that Mary just described previously. We did see a, a relationship between higher social determinants of health scores um, and dogs being more likely to have ear infections and dermatitis. So this means that um, the higher SDH scores, um, a participant experienced fewer social determinants of health challenges, um, and therefore they ended up with more ear infections, more dermatitis. And that might seem initially counterintuitive, um, but this similarly goes to this idea that if you have less barriers to obtaining care and less barriers, uh, social determinants of health barriers, you'll be more able to access a vet. Um, which therefore you're more likely to obtain a very common um, diagnosis. Here you'll see also that lower social determinants of health scores um, had a relationship with anaplasma. Anaplasma is a tick-borne illness. Um, so the dogs were less likely to develop anaplasma when people had fewer barriers to social determinants of health um, and fewer barriers to participating in girls. Um, this absolutely um, makes sense. Uh, we, we see that folks who are necessarily potentially better off with their social determinants of health um, have dogs that are less likely to be exposed to environmental conditions such as parasites. Now, the, the other finding we see here is that folks who have higher girls participation scores or fewer barriers to participating in girls um, had high grade mast cell tumors become more likely for diagnosis with their dogs. Um, and we also would probably attribute this to the fact that folks who have less barriers to participation are just going to the vet more often. Um, and there's a higher degree of surveillance um, of their dog's health. Now, um, we did do a analysis of if any of the scales we just talked about um, have any relationship to each other. What we found were that, that when you had higher social determinants of health scores, they were moderately related to higher human animal bond scores. Um, we believe here that the social determinants of health drive the human animal bond here um, versus the other way around. <laughs> um, that if someone has fewer barriers to care, um, they may likely have um, the, the higher bond with their pets. Um, now, this relationship likely arises the same um, social determinants of health um, vary, excuse me, in higher correlation of social determinants of health scores being strongly related to higher girls participation scores, um, this relationship likely arises because the same issues related to social determinants of health are also barriers to participating in girls. Um, think about this like healthcare access and quality, economic stability, um, and neighborhood and built environment. So implications for future research. 
Uh, just generally, the function by which pet ownership may be associated with human health benefits is still fairly understudied. So causational research designs are helpful to understand the direction of this association. Also, compliance and retention are difficult concepts to research in, um, and in, in research in general. So having a further understanding of barriers to participation, um, as we outlined in those barriers to girls participation scores, um, can provide researchers with knowledge to make research just more accessible, um, having more folks able to engage in research. Um, the current study we just described assessed which factors contribute to the high rates of compliance in girls, um, but better understanding the factors influencing those high rates of compliance can be used not only to help interpret the findings from girls from this study, um, but also help improve the designs of future veterinary and human health clinical trials. So implications for dog owners, implications for our growth participants. Um, bottom line, it takes a village. We see with this Facebook um, usage um, and the, both the degree to which y'all use the Facebook group um, and what you do with the Facebook group is that people are providing support to each other um, and people are remaining engaged. Um, this, this is really important. Um, also, all of you are taking your time, um, a very long time in this longitudinal study um, and your resources to engage in this study. Um, girls happens because y'all are, are work, be participating and adhering to the protocols. Um, with the recognition that environmental conditions could have impacts on pet health, um, as we saw with some of the correlations between the dog health diseases um, and social determinants of health, it, it's important that we recognize those environmental conditions may have impacts on pet health and advocate for programs and policymaking efforts to address those social determinants of health um, so that other folks' dogs, um, other folks' pets um, have a, a more positive health outcomes. And that is our presentation. So we are happy to answer any questions um, or any other thoughts. And if you would like to ask further questions, feel free to reach out to us via email here at liana.moss at du.edu. Well, thanks, Liana and Mary. And I'm actually going to jump in here because I can. And I got a question that I'm going to see if you guys can answer. And then I personally have a question. <laughs> so I'm going to really put you guys on the spot. First, from the gang out who's listening, someone asked, does the relationship between SDH score and girls barrier not imply that health risks in the general golden retriever population are underreported? Mm. So, okay, let's see. Do, is this written anywhere? I'm so sorry. No, um, and I'm sorry. Okay. If I, um, I, you can actually, you can maybe see it, Liana, in the Q and A. Yep. Okay. So the question was essentially w the correlation between the girls' barriers and the social determinants of health challenges. Um, does that not say that they're underreported disease conditions? Yep. Okay. Um, well, I think I understand the question, but whoever asked it, please clarify if if um, if we're not answering it fully. Um, you know, we see these these this correlation between the social determinants of health and the girls' barriers, um, primarily because they are ex assessing the same issue, which is access to veterinary care, access to veterinary appointments, um, physical location, things like that. So yes, um, if you see that there are challenges and social determinants of health and girls barriers to girls' participation, um, folks are unable to get to the vet, um, get veterinary care for their pet. Um, we we can say that there's probably that in the general population. Um, just the nature of of where we are, there's a lot of literature out there that access to veterinary care is a really, really um, highly important issue right now. Um, it's difficult for folks to access vet care and to afford veterinary care. So we could assume potentially that that lack of access to care means that some golden retriever or just general dog population, health conditions, diseases um, are being underreported because folks aren't getting to the vet. Okay, another quick question for you guys from someone in, I believe, um, 
that you guys did not consider pet insurance in this, like whether people had it or not for this study, correct? We did not look at pet insurance for, for this particular study. Okay. And I'm going to just say to the folks out there in answer to that, we are collecting that information, <laughs> right? But not for this study. Okay. I'm going to ask my questions. As a clinician, when I'm looking at your reported like conditions associated, right, with SDH, high or lower. One is uh, otitis and dermatitis are really common. They often require repeated visits. They don't require any high-level diagnostics. And I didn't know if that would influence your results. The flip side is anaplasma, unless it's changed, I don't think it has, is an expensive test. Like it's usually uh, uh, on it's like a tick tick disease or blood panel. And so that would be maybe something people would not pay for if you didn't mm -hmm. have a high degree of suspicion and mm -hmm. whether that might influence your results. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, could you refer the first question? The, the first, first was the otitis because yeah. it's a co condition that you often have to go back a couple of times. I know people yeah. out there, are, I have a dog with otitis. I saw it in practice, whether that could be influencing the results you're seeing. And then the flip is a very expensive disease. Could yes. that be reflected? Great question. Yeah, no, great question. So with all of these disease conditions, we recognize that, um, you know, for example, maybe uh, a chronic health condition on the annual veterinary questionnaire, it's going to come up more than once. It could come up three years that someone's involved in the study. Um, for the purpose of our study, we we aggregated those diagnoses into, into one. So if someone was diagnosed, if a pet was diagnosed with ear infections three years in a row, um, we counted that as, as one versus three. So, because we didn't want to skew those results, um, acknowledging that some of these are chronic health conditions. Um, so, and then in terms of the anaplasma, um, that's a great question. And it may have a factor in that is the cost of the diagnosis. Um, it's a similar um, logic we applied to the high-grade mast cell tumor diagnoses is that the cost of a biopsy may be high um, if, if not covered by the stipend for girls. Um, and therefore, some folks may choose not to, um, to, to get a di that diagnosis and that biopsy, leading to folks with fewer barriers to care to have a higher incidence of that diagnosis. Okay. Well, that would fit maybe with that too, because that's an expensive test. So one more question, and then I'm going to let Julia, we'll, we'll give you guys a break. Um, and you may have gone over this, but someone did ask, what determines the animal-human bond score? Yeah, it's a great question. Mary, you want to take that? Sure. Um, so the human-animal bond score was, uh, the one that we use in our survey was two subscales from the pet attachment lifetime scale. And it was the one subscale being love, one subscale being negative impact. Um, and it's not a perfect scale because love and emotional attachment is a difficult thing to kind of standardize into an instrument. Um, but it asks questions like, um, how much time do you spend with your pet? Uh, like, are the economic burdens worth having a pet? Things of that nature to kind of try to get the idea of love and emotional attachment on into a number. Um, it tries its best. It definitely has some imperfections, uh, but that is the, the subscales that we used from the pet attachment lifetime scale. Great. Thank you, Mary. All right. We're going to put you guys backstage right now. Thank you so much. And if you, for those folks listening, if you have questions, you can continue to feed them to me. And if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll get the gang back. But now without further ado, we will get the lovely Dr. Labadee on here. Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a project that I did while I was at Morris Animal Foundation. Um, the goal of this study was to evaluate whether residential proximity to local environmental pollution sources um, increases the risk of developing lymphoma. And this is my dog, Maggie, who's a big supporter of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. She's not in the study, though. Um, and then next slide. 
So I did this work with three main collaborators. So Ross Litke uh, was a DVM student at the time, and he was doing a research externship um, using Golden Retriever Lifetime Study data. He has now moved on to an oncology residency, which is super exciting. So he's in Minnesota um, and has a couple years left with that. Uh, Lauren Trepanier, she's a faculty member at University of Wisconsin. She's been a big supporter of Morris Animal Foundation, has been on our review boards, and has had many grants funded by Morris. Um, and I'll talk at the end about some work that she's still doing um, on Golden Retriever study data. Um, she was also Ross's PhD advisor while he was getting his PhD. And then lastly, um, Ashley Tyndall, who's also a PhD student um, at University of Wisconsin working with Lauren and also currently working on some more girl retriever study data. Um, next slide. So despite how common lymphoma is, we still don't know a lot about what causes it, and therefore we haven't really made a lot of progress in actually preventing it from occurring in the first place. So we know that certain breeds seem to be at a higher risk of lymphoma, um, which suggests that genetics definitely play a role. Um, there's also some geographic differences, both in overall prevalence of lymphoma and in the distribution of subtypes throughout the U.S., in the world, um, which suggests that there's environmental influences as well. Some studies have shown that certain chemical and environmental exposures are associated with lymphoma risk. Um, so things like secondhand smoke or herbicides or household chemicals. Um, however, many of these studies are quite dated, um, some over 30 years ago, and have had a really small number of dogs of diverse breeds um, and likely weren't as discriminatory about diagnosing lymphoma as we are now and that we have the fortune um, to be in this study. So next. So the goal of our study was to evaluate whether um, specific environmental factors increase lymphoma risk. So the benefits of this study, um, as I'm sure you all know, are that we have one breed of dog, which limits some of the genetic influences for lymphoma. Um, and we also have well-defined exposures and cancer diagnoses, thanks to all the questionnaires um, that owners and vets have completed. So for each dog, we were able to calculate their household of longest residence leading up to their diagnosis, so we could take into account if they moved. Um, and we used that address to estimate their exposures. So for one source, we used publicly available data to pull average annual ozone and PM 2.5 levels for the county of re residence. So PM 2.5 is particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. So basically these are teeny tiny particles of air pollution that can travel deep down into your respiratory tract and cause damage. Um, we also used maps to determine the proximity to a whole slew of environmental pollution sources of interest. So things like um, municipal dumps, landfills, uh, manufacturing plants, coal plants, um, et cetera. And then we also used those lovely owner completed questionnaires to calculate whether dogs were exposed to secondhand smoke exposure. Um, next. So the study started two years ago. So this was back in January, 2021. So we had far fewer lymphoma cases at that time. Um, so at that point we had 49 cases of lymphoma that were confirmed via um, either histopathology or cytology. And we randomly selected um, two cancer-free control dogs per case that were the same age and sex as that case. Um, so uh, next. So cases at this time were on average just under six years old, which is again, a factor of the timing of when we pulled this data. Um, we were pretty evenly split between males and females. Um, the majority of each of those groups were spayed or neutered, which makes sense um, with those ages. Our regional distribution was sort of similar to what we see overall in the study. So pretty similar to what Brenna showed in her say the study paper. We did kind of see slightly less dogs in the Pacific region. So you'll see that only 6% of the cases were in that Pacific region um, and a little bit more in the Midwest. I don't think we can say here that um, dogs in the Pacific region are protected from lymphoma. I think this is probably just by chance um, given our low number of cases, but we'll definitely keep an eye on that as we're getting more cases coming in. Um, most dogs also live in suburban areas, which I believe is also consistent with the study overall. Um, next. Okay, so this is um, not the prettiest graph, so I'll walk you through it. Um, so we analyzed the association between um, each exposure of interest and lymphoma risk and calculated what we call odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals. So 
as you can see from this figure, we have each exposure of interest on the left. Um, if you memorized my slide about all the exposures we were interested in, you'll see that some are missing here. Um, and that's just because some, some pollutant sources didn't have anybody that lived near them, so we weren't able to look at them. So each dot on this graph represents the odds ratio. And then you can see these whiskers that come out and those are the confidence interval. So if both the dot and the whiskers are on the right side of this dashed line, which is at one, that means that it is a risk factor for lymphoma. So in this case, you can see that nothing quite reaches that criteria. Um, however, I think if you next slide, it'll make a box come up. You can see that um, having three or more exposures almost reached statistical significance um, and, and was associated with actually two and a half times increased risk of lymphoma. So this could indicate that possibly there's some sort of cumulative effect of exposures, um, or it could be like a marker of living in a more urban environment or something like that. So this is definitely something we'd like to look at more in future studies, um, because perhaps with larger numbers, this would come out as statistically significant and could be um, important. Um, it's also worth pointing out that we had very few dogs that had secondhand expo smoke exposure, which is great, um, but that means that we um, have a pretty wide confidence interval there, so we don't have a lot of, of confidence in our estimate. And also for... Um, ozone and the PM 2.5 measures, those were only available from publicly available data at the county level and not every county reports these. So often more rural counties don't necessarily report these. So there's a little bit of bias there um, and we had quite a bit of missing data. So I'd take those with a little bit of a grain of salt as well. Um, on the next slide, we split our results out also as B and T cell. Um, as these subtypes likely have different etiologies. If you've ever heard me talk before, I like to harp on this, um, that I think that B cell and T cell lymphoma have different risk factors. And so we need to really look at them um, separately. But you can see here that the numbers were pretty low for these analyses, only 20 or so dogs in each group. Um, so nothing reached statistical significance, but we, we could see a couple of potentially interesting trends. Um, so for one, um, household proximity to incineration plants appear to be more common among the B cell cases. So you, if you look at the incineration plants on that left graph, it's kind of trending towards um, being an increased risk, whereas for the T cell, it's like perfectly in the middle. It's not associated at all. And then we also see that um, proximity to railroad embankment tracks seems to be more of a risk factor for T cell cases and not so for B cell cases. So again, we don't have enough numbers to definitively say that these are, are differing risk factors, but I think that this, um, I will self-serve that this supports my belief that these are different diseases um, and should be looked at separately. And hopefully we can continue to do that. Um, next. So in summary, we didn't have any statistically significant information from this study that we can definitively say is a risk factor lymphoma, um, but it did provide us with a lot of useful information to help direct future research. So it gives us some evidence that overall pollutant burden might be important. Um, it also, again, reinforces that lymphoma subtypes um, probably have different risk factors. A couple of the major limitations of this study that we can improve in the future and improve even within this within Golden Retriever Lifetime study um, is having a larger number of cases. So as I mentioned, it's been two years since we pulled this data. Um, so if we were to pull it again today, we would we would probably be able to see a bit more already. Um, also, with the exception of the secondhand smoke exposure, we didn't truly assess individual level exposures in this study. So this is what we call an ecological study. Um, so this comes with a couple of limitations. So just because you live near a chemical plant doesn't mean that your dog is actually exposed to that pollutant regularly. So it's possible that you work in a different county and you bring your dog to work with you every day. So your dog actually is never really near that at all. Um, it's also possible that that you you do live near that and spend most of your time there, but your dog is inside 90% of the time and only goes outside for a couple seconds to pee. So it's really not exposed much in comparison to a dog that's like maybe going for daily walks and actually getting closer to that chemical plant every day. So those aren't factors we were able to account for in the way we looked at this data, but hopefully something we can look at soon. Um, and that brings me to the last slide, 
um, which is back to Dr. Trepanier. So she's actually currently working on addressing these limitations already, which is awesome. Um, so she is using some of our banked urine samples to actually assess um, individual level exposures to what we call volatile organic compounds and herbicides. Um, so she'll be able to more definitively say if a dog was actually exposed to that pollutant source. Um, she's also looking at this in a, another way, which is evaluating our banked blood samples for DNA damage. And so she's trying to see if dogs, if they can actually detect DNA damage prior to developing lymphoma. So the thought is that exposure to harmful agents can cause DNA damage and then ultimately lead to lymphoma. So it's really cool that we have those sequential samples so that we can do that. And then lastly, she's looking at whether dogs that live near fracking sites or in areas with high radon levels um, are more likely to get lymphoma. And that's because both of those are suspected to be carcinogenic. Um, she actually just emailed me a few hours ago to say that that paper is almost ready. Um, so hopefully we'll have those results really soon. I also have included a random picture of a boxer here because she's also doing um, a lot of this work in boxers since they're predisposed to lymphoma as well. So if you have friends that have boxers, um, definitely reach out to her because I think she's still recruiting for some of these studies. And with that, I can take any questions or I guess the group will take questions. Yeah. Well, first, actually, thanks a bunch, Julia. I actually have a question. Yeah. And because uh, one, you talked about railroad tracks. So what exactly is the chemical or whatever that you would be exposed to if you're near railroad tracks? Yeah, so that's a Ross question. <laughs> um, I believe that it's probably sort of like the coal um, like coming from the train. Creosote yeah. maybe? Or yeah. Something? Okay, okay. Yeah. He picked all of the environmental pollutant sources because that's his background. And so I just did what he told me. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't. I wasn't yeah. sure about what they were looking for. Um, and then maybe you could quickly talk about lymphoma subtypes because you mentioned it. And I think we think of lymphoma as a monolith disease, like it's all the same, but it's not. Can you Can you talk about that? Yeah, so there's over... Gosh, I think over 60 different subtypes of lymphoma. Um, and they're most basically split as I did between B and T cells. So these are different types of cells in the immune system um, that have slightly different functions and how they fight off infections and things like that. And then within even like a B cell subtype, um, there's different types of tumors that arise from different points in the development of B cells. So, so if you've heard of like acute leukemia that arises from a very early immune system cell and it is associated with a very aggressive clinical course whereas there's other diseases like um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia which is a b-cell disease of mature lymphocytes and that often has a much longer clinical course dogs can do pretty well for a long time with that um, so these diseases behave really differently and and they arise at different points during the development so that's why it kind of makes sense that they probably have different risk factors as well. Sorry, I was muted there. Someone asked about, are there any links that between vaccination and lymphoma? I haven't seen any studies on that. Um, the only vaccination and cancer studies that I'm aware of are actually in cats um, and not with lymphoma, but with um, a different type of tumor that they can get. But I think as far as what we've seen in both in humans and in dogs, we haven't seen any associations there. Yeah, I was gonna say I haven't, other than the cats and the vaccine, you know, injection site sarcomas, mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything about lymphoma yet. So now we're getting some questions. Let me see. Um, Okay, uh, which you may not be able to answer, <laughs> but I'll ask it. And anyone on the panel, like Brenna or anyone else, uh, it says, when are you going to attempt to correlate DNA variations of Goldens with the occurrence of hemangiosarcoma and other cancers? I think that's underway, um, was my understanding. I, I think so too, um, uh, Suzanne, who asked that. I said, was Brenna. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, someone else asked, but I, I can answer this as well, about cancer and people with wood stoves and fireplaces, and that is on the table, of mm -hmm. course, because yeah. there's a reason we ask that, and I know it's a big buzzword right now because of the whole gas stove 
and people and exposures. But uh, all you guys who've had to answer those questions year after year after year. Yeah. Thank you. Because that's yes. very important data. And that was actually part of Ross's original, um, sorry, Dr. Litke, part of his original goal was to look at that as well um, in this study. And we just sort of, he was only here for two weeks and managed to get this entire study done, which is incredible. Um, so that was one that fell, fell by the wayside. Also, hi, Pam. <laughs> and someone else asked about diet and that is another million dollar question and yes it will be looked at but i think uh, julia can attest and brenna as well the diet data is tough right as you guys know who are filling out all those it's, it's detailed and that's going to take a little bit of time to to sift through but it it you're absolutely right it's on the on the table for sure and then someone else asked about, but I've never heard of this, Apoquil related to lymphoma. I've heard um, anecdotes about it, but I've never actually seen a true study that's shown it as far as I can remember. Um, but I have, I have heard that as a potential concern. Um, I give my dog Apoquil and I wouldn't stop because it makes her quality of life so much better. I know, I know that's going to be a good one. And I think just for people who are asking, these are all great questions. And that is why we're looking at, we're collecting all this data because it's also, I think, time of exposure. Like we don't always have a good sense of, well, is this one injection of Apoquil or 10 injections of Apoquil or zero injections of Apoquil? You know, we don't, we don't know those answers yet, but that's why it's great to capture this data, especially prospectively. And now I'm going to do the shameless promotion portion of this pot, um, this webinar, because for all of you listening, the next few podcast episodes of Fresh Scoop, we have the hemangiosarcoma team from Minnesota was our January guests. And in March, you can hear Dr. Lauren Trepanier talking about a little bit more detail, which she's going to do with her girl samples. And that's going to be our March episode. And May will be lymphoma. Lymphoma Arama with the uh, gang from CSU talking about um, different types of lymphoma. So stay tuned for all of those because I think they're going to be interesting. And you guys, thank you so much because you've given me some ideas for questions to ask the guests on the podcast. I don't know if the rest of the group want to join us. I don't see any other questions. Um, oh, here's another one of uh, flea and tick meds with cancer probably will be looked at because we capture all of this stuff eventually. But I don't know of anyone that's specifically looking at this yet. And one thing I will say, and I think Julia will agree with me as a um, epidemiologist is sometimes we have very low numbers, right? And it's, we, we almost have to wait till we get a little further along and get more numbers. And you might think, well, 40 sounds like a lot of dogs, but it's in the big scheme of things, it may not be. But when we get up higher, it may certainly be significant. And it may take thousands, unfortunately, ultimately, right, to really be able to tell some of this. So I don't know, Julia, you want to speak about numbers? Because I think that's always a really hard concept to get our heads around. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's numbers, not only of how many dogs we have with lymphoma, but of how many have that risk factor of interest. So, so like I was saying, some of these exposure, the pollutant sources, we only had a couple of dogs that were actually exposed to those. So we couldn't look at that. So flea and tick is a great option where most of the dogs have been exposed to those because most people do give those. So as soon as we have enough dogs with cancer, we can actually really look at that. Um, but other things that are a little more rare um, as exposures are harder to look at. Yeah, they're, I think they're hard to get around. Someone asked again. So if you guys go to about the podcast, if you go to our website, if you look up Fresh Scoop, it's on Apple, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, you can find it pretty much anywhere you get it. We also have it on our website that you can listen to. So thank you for the shameless promotion part. But these are all great questions about, someone asked about melanoma and yeah, all cancers are fair game, right? We're counting them all, we're looking at them all. I don't think we have a lot of melanoma diagnoses, but Brenna, Julia, like I didn't see very many 
No, we don't have a whole bunch of those yet. Not enough to to start studying it quite yet. Yeah, they're I I mean, okay, so I'm I'm going to uh, put anecdote out here which is always uh, wrong, but I would say when I was in practice, goldens are not dogs I saw a lot of melanoma in. Um poodles seem to be um anything with like a lot of pigment, right? Especially in the mouth. Uh I don't know, Julia, you want to pop in Brenna? You guys practice so seen seen it yeah i haven't seen a ton i and i think that the melanoma cases i remember seeing from from the golden retriever study were like pretty abnormal melanoma cases like really rare um types of it okay somebody else asked and this is tough um carprofen issues uh and i'm gonna I will start, I will let Julia jump in here. Um, as far as when I was in practice and as the owner of a Labrador retriever, I'm gonna tell you when carprofen first came out, we saw problems in Huskies, Northern breeds uh, in general and Labradors is having more reactions. They tend to happen fast. It has been associated with some liver toxicity. And so sometimes, you know, your vet will monitor liver enzymes. There's a reason for that. They're on carprofen. And then it becomes a risk reward sort of thing. Is my Labrador on carprofen for arthritis? Absolutely. Are her liver enzymes creeping up ever a little bit? You bet. And I'm watching those. But again, it's a risk reward, just like, Julia said, and Julia, I don't know if you want to pop in here with your experience, but I've never heard of it with cancer. Have you? Yeah, I haven't heard anything with cancer. I was going to say the same thing about Labradors. And actually, right before I popped on here, my sister was texting me that her older lab on Careprofen liver enzymes are starting to go up. So it's definitely um, a concern for the kind of longer term use. Um, but still, it's it's a, such a great medication for pain control for arthritis that often the, the pros outweigh the cons. Yeah, you know, I, I, as an, hopefully Julia would appreciate this as an epidemiologist, I think what a lot of sometimes when we're looking at health data, we are often balancing that risk reward, right? Um, and, and we make, have to make decisions based individually, personalized decisions for our pets, for us on what um, the risk might be for a certain drug or medication or treatment versus what is our reward. And we do it all the time, right? We balance those. And I think that's where epidemiology and these kind of studies really help us to make the best informed decisions because that's really what we want to know, right? What is the best we can do? What are with the information we have? So um, I don't know, do you add to that? Yes, I don't know if my internet still kind of cutting out. You just got wonky on me. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think so often it's kind of a feel because we don't always have all that research. Um, and then the papers that we come from, um, like this, this most recent question, you know, sometimes we have a lot of papers with like smaller numbers. And so each, each of those is giving you like a piece of information and you kind of have to put it all together, um, and, and sort of decide what you think makes the most sense. Um, because we can't, we can't get a definitive answer from one study ever. Um, even if it's giant at it all, everything has sort of, um, some biases that can affect it. And so, um, taking everything together from different sources and things give us the most complete picture. Okay. And the giant hook is coming in from Amy from the side to let me know that it is time. These have been great questions, everyone. And I'm so appreciative to our guests, Brenna, who doesn't like public speaking and did a great job. So well done, Brenna, Liana and Mary. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Julia, as always, great to see you. And I uh, appreciate everyone who sent some such great questions and we'll be back in a few months with another really exciting episode of golden zoomies so thanks everyone